Welcome to the New England Historical Association's Fall 2021 Virtual Conference. My name is Jessica Parr of Simmons University, and I'm the president of the New England Historical Association this year. I'd like to kick off our conference with a few acknowledgements and thanks to those who have helped make this conference possible. We are graciously hosted by Worcester State University. We'd like to first thank Dean Ross Pottle of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences for his support, as well as that of History and Political Science Chair, Dr. Charlotte Haller. This program has been arranged by Vice President Charlotte Grady, and local arrangements are by Executive Secretary Tona Hangen. Thank you also goes to all of our colleagues at Worcester State who have generously donated a Saturday to help host sessions and make sure things that run smoothly. And finally, NEHA would like to help thank everyone who has stuck with us through what is our third Zoom conference of this pandemic. We hope to see you in the spring when we convene at UMass Lowell. Thank you very much. Greetings to the New England Historical Association. My name is Russ Pottle. I am Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Worcester State University. Welcome to the membership and leadership of NEHA. A special welcome to President Parr. My wife is a Simmons alumna and she sends her best regards. As we welcome you to Worcester State University, we acknowledge that the university's campus sits on the unceded lands of the Nipmuc people. We decry with sorrow the violence and wanton cruelty that attended that dispossession. As we seek to honor the traditions and practices of the Nipmuc people, we acknowledge that we, like all non-Native residents of Native lands, have benefited from centuries of systematic genocide. One of the main purposes of a university is the creation of knowledge, not simply the collection and dissemination of knowledge. And in bringing your research, your ideas, your methods, your findings in this conference to our campus, our virtual campus, you help us fulfill part of our mission. And for that, we are grateful. So we're happy to have you here. I had, in preparing these remarks, thought about saying something really profound like, um, we've never needed historians more than we need them now, um, which I believe is true. And I don't think we have to go into the, uh, the whys and wherefores of why that is true. But then I began to think. Uh, we have needed uh, historians more than we've ever needed them before uh, in a, a year ago, uh, in the summer where some of the white community in the United States began to wake up to what it meant historically to be a black person in America. Um, and then I thought, well, we also needed historians more than we'd ever needed them before back in the mid-2000s uh, with the rise of the global strongman. Um, and then began to think, well, we've needed them before that too. So to conclude with that, um, we, uh, we need you now more than ever, historians, and we've always needed you now more than ever. So we're very happy you're here. A conference is a great time. It's a time of spinning out ideas, uh, examining methods, uh, looking at new, uh, you know, new findings, and beginning to discuss those, the messy but fun work of discussing those among yourselves and, uh, and leading that eventually to, uh, to something that adds to the fabric of your great discipline. Uh, so we, we certainly welcome that. Um, we also, as we open this conference, remember uh, a longtime NEHA member uh, and an emeritus faculty member of uh, Worcester State University, the late Bruce Cohen. Uh, who died during the early days of the pandemic. I know we've all been affected by that, and so we each in our own way uh, remember those folks who once were with us and now are not. Um, but not to end uh, on a gloomy note, um, again, a conference is a wonderful thing. I'm looking very much forward to listening to some of the papers. Um, so enjoy the day, um, and we hope to see you at some point in time in person on the campus of Worcester State University. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Fall NEHA Conference. Thank you to our hosts, to our great organizers, the staff um, of NEHA, its volunteer staff. Uh, and thank you also to my colleagues on the committee. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to all of them. I am here to announce the winner of this year's James P. Hanlon Book Prize, um, who is 
Sylvia Sellers Garcia, professor at Boston College, for her work, The Woman on the Windowsill, A Tale of Mystery in Several Parts, published by Yale University Press in 2020. I would like to share some comments my colleagues made. I found Sylvia's book to be not only a gripping read that was difficult to put down, but also a real masterpiece in archival research. In fact, more than just about any other work I've read that seeks to deconstruct the archive, Sylvia's book allowed me to see her methodology and how it was shaped by the documentary record while still maintaining a clear narrative. She manages to inject her voice into the analysis without disrupting the book's flow. And those personal interjections raise penetrating questions about the historical process. Above all else, she brings to life the world of late 18th century Guatemala City and its people, especially those whose voices are muted or muffled in the archive. My only complaint was that I wanted an answer to the whodunit. Kidding aside, this is just an impressive weaving together of social and cultural history. To quote another colleague, Sellers Garcia probes the available archival sources to approach possible subjects and conditions that led to the murders. But what sets this book apart is her probing of the power dynamics of the archive itself. Readers learn whose voices and stories are highlighted in the archives, which in turn reveals glaring absences or silences. The book offers a window into the historical process and the challenges of recreating a lost historical world that still resonates with and speaks to a 21st century audience. This book was a pleasure to read, a judgment all of my colleagues affirmed heartily. We congratulate Professor Sellers Garcia and encourage each of you to order this book for your library, pick it up and read it, enjoy it, and learn from some great historical scholarship. Please enjoy the rest of the conference and consider submitting your own work for consideration by next year's prize committee. Thank you. I'm so pleased to have the chance to thank the New England Historical Association for awarding The Woman in the Windowsill, A Tale of Mystery in Several Parts, this year's James P. Hanlon Book Prize. And I'm especially grateful to the committee for its comments and its recognition of this book, since the comments seem to bear out the two greatest hopes I had for this work. The first was that it would reach a broader audience uh, beyond Latin America. It is usually a Latin Americanist readership that would be pulled into a, a micro history about urban Guatemala. And I'm thrilled to see that it ha might have a place in a larger conversation. And second, I was really hoping that this book would be able to contribute uh, a com to the conversation on methods and the practice of history. And here too, the comments of the committee made me feel that perhaps the book had a place in these broader conversations. Thank you so much for underscoring these aspects of the book. I had not initially intended to write this kind of story at all. Uh, as I mentioned early on in the book, I was researching social violence more broadly. And I came across this case with an illustration in the margin that I wasn't able to decipher. And as I started reading more closely to try to understand what the illustration was about, I found that I was in the middle of a gruesome crime that really required more comprehension and certainly a little bit of exploration, even though I knew that I might not reach the end of it. And in fact, this story is just that. It is both a mystery, but it's also a story about dead ends. And I think that that's something we can all uh, identify with in the broader field of history where the research process meets dead ends over and over again. And so what do we do when we encounter these dead ends? This was one of the larger problems that I wanted to try to encounter uh, in the telling of this story. So one part of the story is about what this gruesome crime means, what it meant to the people of Guatemala City, how it was interpreted by the people who viewed these spectacles of human body parts left on windowsills. But the second inquiry is about the process of history and how the historian goes about 
piecing together meaning when there tends to be so much unknown about the past. The other consideration that drove me through the writing of this book was thinking about these broader silences in the archive. And I wanted to mention in connection with this book that there are some significant silences in the Archivo General de Centroamérica, not just because of the usual processes of archival uh, document decay and the weather, which can be a challenge in a very humid place like Guatemala, but also partly because of the politics of how some of these archives are kept. This beleaguered archive in Guatemala City has survived mostly thanks to the Herculean work of ordinary archivists who have done such tremendous labors over the years to keep the archive functioning, often without proper funds and almost always without proper uh, help in, the ter in terms of the number of people who are there available to help. And the archive has also, in some instances, become a kind of hockey puck in some of the national politics, partly because it is understood to be connected with other archives that have explosive content related to the Guatemalan armed conflict. And I raise this because I feel like it's an opportunity for us to think more broadly as historians about archives in peril and how it is that we can raise awareness in a broader community of historians about archives that are facing the ordinary processes of decay, yes, the shortages of funding, yes, but also some incredible pressures from local uh, political conditions. The Archivo General de Centroamérica so far has survived and weathered these storms, but it can really do with our continued attention uh, as scholars in the United States and also um, the increasing attention brought to bear by people using and researching this archive. So if there is something to come out of this uh, book, which is as much a story about the archive as it is a story about crime, I hope it will intrigue you not just in terms of the sordidness of the story, but also in terms of the intrigue that um, might be left to be resolved regarding archives in places like Guatemala. Thank you.